come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We talk about movies every Saturday. Whether you're ready for it or not, this is all part of our quest for total world domination. We hope that you'll help us out with that task by going over to wherever you found us and hitting that like or that subscribe button or, hey, even giving us a review. All of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you who are into the same kind of schlock that we're into. These are the Internet Radio Superstars. Holly. Michaela. John. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by... You! All of you! Some of you. Some of you? Every goddamn one of you. (laughs) That's right. Somebody voted for this. Uh, Through the month of December, we had a listener's choice voting poll. Uh, A bunch of movies were suggested and then voted upon by you guys. So thank you very much for each and every suggestion that you gave us. Uh, We're working our way through it. We did, uh, what was our first one? Big Trouble in Little China. We did Mm -hmm. The Hidden last week. Mm -hmm. And tonight, we watched. Uh, Full title. Uh, Across the Eighth Dimension. Uh, Good call, Sean. I forgot the adventures of our focused (laughs) on the Eighth Dimension. Yeah. That's right. What year was The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension made? That's, that's a great question. Colin. It's 84? It was 1984 <laughs> and directed by. It was Arnold two initials. W.D. Richter. Um, W.D. Richter. All right, I'll fill w. in the blanks. <laughs> he was. Uh, W.D. Richter, we mentioned a couple weeks ago because he was the co-writer on uh, Big Trouble in Little China. He was uh, gained some prominence as the uh, he wrote the remake, the well-regarded remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. He wrote a personal favorite of mine, which was the remake of Dracula in 1979. Um and he, uh, I think he, this is his directorial debut, uh, Buckaroo Banzai. And uh, I think he directed only one other movie, and that was called Late for Dinner, which I think starred Peter Berg and was about like two airmen who are cryogenically frozen and then get unthawed in the 80s and the 90s or whatever. I didn't see it and can't comment any further. Um, <laughs> it's like a different version of Forever Young, right? Yeah, because well, Forever Young was a '90s movie, right? I think that this yeah. was also. I think he also maybe wrote Stealth, the Jamie Fox movie. Yeah, Jessica he did. Hollow. That was his like last writing credit. That movie is fucking terrible. Holy shit! Has yeah. anyone revisited that? Should be his last. No, that was not need. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. Yeah, that, seen that's it. true. There is no need. There was no, there was no visit <laughs> off the bat on that one. <laughs> there was no first visit. Yeah. No. <laughs> John didn't need to make that mistake like the rest I, of us. No, it even it came into my work as part of one of the movies we show, and I was just like, somebody else can take that. I don't want <laughs> <laughs> All right, so who among us has seen the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension prior to this evening? Uh, I think just you, Colin. No, I haven't yeah, seen, never it. seen it. Oh, Colin, you've never seen, seen Colin? it. That's right. So we are what? going with. Oh, wow. People wow. who have never experienced the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension or wow. in their lives. I thought I had, but I think it was on like wow. uh, some channel and I caught bits and pieces of it sitting down tonight. I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, have I not can't seen tell this movie. If, I can't tell if um, you remember watching this movie or you wouldn't remember watching this movie. I'm having a hard time on that one. I yeah. Yeah, I have a theory. I think this was something people watched a lot as kids, and that's why yeah. it has a cult following. That's the only thing I can figure out. Yeah. Well, that's when I wonder. I mean, even watching it tonight, I'm like, you know, are there new devotees of uh, Bakaru Banzai, or is this like a nostalgia movie? And then you always kind of go like, you know, there's a lot of movies I like, and I tell people they're the greatest things ever. And then when they watch them, they're always kind of they react cold to it. I'm like, Ooh, that's. Uh... See, and I feel like I feel like I have a pretty good gauge of things that I like that 
I know other people probably won't like it. I feel like I've got a pretty good gauge on that. But well, I could, Colin, fig- uh, I could not figure out who this movie was for. Me neither. And like, Colin, it's interesting you say that because I know it's like pretty heavily referenced in Ready Player One, both the book and the movie. So I wonder if it got like a second wind from that. But I agree. I agree, Holly. I could not tell if this was meant for kids or adults or what. I don't know who the yeah. target audience is for this movie. No, I don't know. I feel like like the nature of it, the tone of it is very kid-like. But the content, I feel like, is way too much for kids. I don't think they'd be able to follow it. Yeah. Because I, I was trying to figure out, like, what are our reference points for... Okay, so, I mean... I guess we can say off the bat, I, I'm not entirely sure that I've ever really seen a movie like this. I mean, what would you say is like the closest analog to uh, to this movie? See, yeah, see, that's another thing is this movie is so all uh, over the place that it, comprehensively, I couldn't even put together a comparison because it's think, just I so... I think the closest thing to this is just a non sequitur in and of itself. I'm pretty sure. Well, I mean, I guess it's kind of, you know, like movies stand out when they're odd, when they're, when they defy classification. And that also could, you know, lead to its cult appeal, you know, because I know there have been, uh, Buckaroo Banzai comic books, like in the real world. I know in the movie there also are Buckaroo Banzai comic books, but like there have been the further adventures of, um, I know at one point they were talking about making a TV series. It's possible. I think Kevin Smith maybe was involved with one of right. these, like bringing back Buckaroo Banzai. That sounds terrible. I, I don't want to see that. I was going to say that sounds terrible, but also that sounds about right. Right. Because yeah. he has like a comic book kind of sensibility and maybe, you know, they'd be able to do something with this concept. Um, which character do you think Jason Mewes would play if they did this as a TV show? Perfect Probably Tom. Probably <laughs> I was going to say the John Lithgow character is who I think he would be. Oh, right, I, yeah. I think he'd be misguided, but I think that's who he would be. So instead of being like Russian, he'd just say smooches all the time? I don't think yeah. he was supposed to be Russian. He said he had an Italian uh, accent that apparently oh, he, yeah. he got. That was, that was the- there was a couple times that I was like, I think it's Italian, and then later I was like, I think it's Russian, and then I was like, I think it's German. Like, it just was all over the place. Well, he's I'm dressed like a Russian. Russian. doesn't know how to do access. <laughs> Based on Pet Cemetery and this fucking movie, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, he knows how to do, like, that, like, kind of, like, imperial, weird English accent, and that's it. That's all he's got. Yeah, this is definitely Russian. I'm gonna say it, though, and I'm pretty sure I, I stated this on Cliffhanger. He can do no wrong. I don't care how bad his accents are. I'm here for it. I am here for over the top John Lithgow in every capacity. Well, I'm still not over Pet Cemetery. That was like that was bad because he didn't even try. Like he didn't even try. He just phoned it in. Like at least in this movie, he's going for it. He's you know, trying in this one, yeah. Yeah, he is way, 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 way over the top in this movie, right? I mean, is that fair to yeah. say? Like, this isn't yeah. a calibrated performance. This is just be as nuts and as big as you can be, John. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, John Lithgow plays the villain of the movie, uh, but he's probably the biggest known commodity in it. He uh, is a character called um, John Wharton or... Um, Emilio Lazardo. Uh, I, I feel like he's. I feel like him and Christopher Lloyd might be neck and neck for fame. He's he's Warfin. Warfin. John Warfin. That's his name. Okay. Well, John, gonna... You could you could honestly tell me any name and I believe you because I that's yeah, that's how much it matters. This is such a alphabet soup movie. Yeah, they're just saying stuff and it doesn't matter. Is that what's going on? So, because I was sitting there, like you, at some point, somebody, you know, tech, we're watching this group chat, obviously, because we can't uh, get together. And uh, somebody was saying, like, okay, I don't, you know, know what's going on. I'm like, well, I think I'm kind of following it for a while before, like, the doldrums set in. But it's like, okay, I think I got the. So the general plot. Let me try and let me try and go overview, here, right? And you tell do you, me do you if I'm read- wrong. Do you want to read the crawl to us? Will that help you, Colin? No, because that's oh, yeah, that a crawl. I think if you're not Star Wars, a crawl is generally a problem when you have that at the beginning of your movie. This also, one does when you add I would agree. Also, when you add detail to it that doesn't matter or come back. 
Yeah, and you can't understand it because you're like, what are we fucking talking about? Like, you know, just give me, just jump into the movie. So I think that's yeah. why they've gotten rid of the crawl, uh, you know, as movies have kind of gone on. I think Star Wars, kind of, everybody had to do it because Star Wars did it. Okay, so if I understand the plot of this movie, and we'll go back an and F. we'll go like scene by scene here, but the general overall gist is that in 1938, there was a um, science experiment that was conducted, which Emilio Lazardo, a scientist, was a part of. And in that uh, experiment, they contacted the eighth dimension. And in that, uh, Lazardo was taken over by an alien who was in the eighth dimension. This is John Warfin, who took over Lazardo's body. And boom. Jump ahead to the future. And Buckaroo Banzai, who is, uh, maybe you guys can tell me what his occupation is. He's, he's a neurosurgeon. He's also he's a rock star. He's, mm -hmm. also he's a martial a arts expert. Did yeah. that ever come into play? No. Ever? No. Okay. Not a Did single you know martial arts have? scene. That was told to us in the crawl that he was a martial arts expert, but that never ever. Sword play, nothing. Uh, ever actually factors, and you just told this about the guy. Yeah. You know what um, this is? This is this is this is Mac from It's Always Sunny creating character. This is exactly yeah, what it is. is. He's like, you know what this guy is? He's like a surgeon, but he's also a karate master, and he's a yeah. rock star. That's exactly what this is. This is a which is sunny episode, which is super juvenile. Yes. Like, that's really juvenile to be like, and he's a spaceman, and yeah. he's a cowboy. It's like, no, pick one thing. Yes. Uh, if we could all just still have that child imagination that we had. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's basically... So the movie was written by... Well, okay, hold on. We'll come back. Okay, so the, the gist, right? So Buckaroo Banzai and his group of scientists, right, were also, yes, rock stars and neurosurgeons, some of them. They are the Hong Kong um, Cavaliers. Why are the Hong Kong Cavaliers? Because why not? It's a cool name for because a band. Because they're martial arts pros, right? That's why. I'm sorry. Are we watching uh, Miami Connection again? <laughs> really what this feels like. Buckaroo Banzai yeah. and the Hong Kong Cavaliers, right? That's unfair, Sean. That was a fun movie. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> well, anyway, Buckaroo <laughs> develops... I, I just need to put it out there for a quick sec. I don't care if your legal name is Buckaroo. I am never calling you that. Ever. I am not saying that to anybody. I will not call you Buckaroo. I will come up with any other nickname. I'm not saying the name Buckaroo. Yeah, it would just be Buck. Bucky, Buck. Buck. Don't care. Well, Never a lot saying of times Buckaroo. They just call him Dr. Banzai. Uh, the crawl tells us that he has a American mother and a Japanese father. Relevant. Um, no, he doesn't. Lies. Well, All lies. Would you be surprised to learn that there was an opening scene to this movie which was deleted, which I tracked down on the YouTubes because Jamie Lee Curtis plays Buckaroo's mother in this opening scene where they explain it's a Clancy Brown. Re You're basically watching 8mm film of a rocket test that they do in the 50s, I think, um, where somebody sabotages the rocket and blows up and it kills both the mother and the father, who was the pilot, leaving poor Buckaroo uh, orphan. And this was deleted from the movie. Um, yeah, I suppose for good reason, we don't... I'm sorry, was she supposed to be a Japanese woman? <laughs> oh, shit, that's right! <laughs> so Jamie no, 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 was sorry. Playing no. The Japanese no, 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 she was the American, the yeah, father Japanese is Japanese. Father. Okay, yeah. I was really concerned for a minute there. I was like, oh, God. Yeah, yeah she doesn't have any lines. This is like home movie footage that we're watching, uh, and Clancy Brown is narrating. Apparently, this set up the sequel because um, the, the plane is sabotaged by uh, Hanoi Zan, the leader of the World Crime League, which is the, the second Buck Buckaroo Banzai movie that ever came out. This is too much detail. Okay, we're going to come back to that. But, uh, so... The aliens, right, from the eighth dimension, who were actually banished there by aliens from the from planet 10, want to get back there. This is John Lithgow. Is basically he's this mass murdering alien who's been exiled down to Earth. He wants to get back. And because Buckaroo develops the, um, oh, man, what was that device called? The over, overthruster, yeah. which allows him to penetrate into the eighth dimension. Uh, 
the aliens converge. They want to get this MacGuffin. This is the thing that will allow them to get back to home. That's the mo- That's the plot of the movie. That's not that hard, right? I just distilled it. That's basically what's right. Going no, on. The, that part is easy. It's everything else around it that's like getting there or doing that plot is just. Yeah. So you know, I would say you summing it up just now was easy for you. <laughs> that wasn't getting actually. That took some work. <laughs> getting that from the movie was not easy. Okay. All right. So let's let's break this down. The movie starts in. Um, well, so the movie was written by a guy. And I'm sorry what his name was, but his name is Earl Mac Rauch, right? Who is a novelist who basically had all these far out crazy ideas. He knew W.D. Richter somehow through like uh, they went to school together or whatever. And so apparently he for like 10 years, starting in the 70s, he tried to keep writing uh, Buckaroo Banzai adventures. And they had all sorts of different names. They weren't, you know, across the eighth dimension always. And so he would start writing a project and get, like, so far into it and then lose interest. Then he'd start it again and then lose interest. He'd start it again and lose interest. Is it George R. 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 Martin? Well, it just said that he had, like, a desk full of drawers, you know, with a bunch of shit, all these papers. And somehow, this is what boggles my mind, but this is why the 80s were so great, that studios would take a chance on something as fucking crazy as this movie, because I can't imagine anyone being able to pitch this at a pitch movie and get somebody to say yes. It's, I mean, it's it's definitely, this movie can only happen in the 80s. That's it. Like, again, I, I know we say it a lot on here. Okay. Like, Co- uh, yeah. What a, what a fuel for film in the 80s, man. Not like, only uh, did it get greenlit, but it got a $12 million budget. I am still baffled by that. Like, I can't believe someone saw this script and was like, yeah, here, have $12 million for that. In yeah. the 80s, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and first-time director, right? Uh, I believe it was a first-time producer also, but, I mean, they got a cast together that today we look at and go, like, holy shit, yeah. look at I'm, this I'm, is a movie full of, like, that guy, <laughs> you know? Like, I'm literally I'm literally picturing, like, a Leonardo DiCaprio Wall Street style, just, like, throwing money. Like, yeah, let's fucking do it. Just, like, throwing money. Like, that's what I'm picturing. It's just some coked-up crazy dude on, on Wall Street. Yeah, the kids are all into Star Wars and science fiction's big right now. And so we're just going to go heavy with, uh, I mean, everybody's doing, I, I guess at this point anyway, you know, kind of unique um, new science fiction stuff. I think 1984. Anybody ever seen Dennis Quaid in Dreamscape, movie where he can get into other people's dreams? No, that was like a fantasy movie that came out this year. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom came out this year. Ghostbusters came out this year. Um, but I mean, science fiction. Oh, and uh, Christopher Lloyd, I mean, who's exactly in this movie, future. was in Star Trek Three. That was also this year. Um, so it's it's kind of like I mean, I guess is it a safe bet if you're just like we're just doing science fiction games and kids they they love science fiction. They'll go see it. They may at that time. Yes. Turns out it was a bad bet because the movie did not even make back its twelve million dollar budget. I uh, oh. It was a colossal bomb, but has existed forever. So much so. That the loyal listeners of the Saturday Night Freak Show in the year of Our Lord 2021 said, you guys should watch this fucking movie. <laughs> so, I mean, clearly it exists in some kind of, uh, you know. Childhood memories? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Again, we'll pose that question to all our listeners. When's the last time you watched it? Um, I, I, have, I have a question that I, I need answered. Did they explain why Jeff Goldblum is dressed like a cowboy? Did I miss that? If they did, I don't want to know. I just okay. want him to. Just, I just want Jeff Goldblum to be his beautiful self as a cowboy in I mean, this yes. movie, and no explanation. Yes. The furry pants kind of threw me for a loop. I think I'd be okay with him as a cowboy if he wasn't wearing big furry pants. Holly, I don't think anything in this movie has explanation, and I think right. it just. I think it. It's almost insulting because it feels like yeah. it doesn't think you'll ask those questions. You know. Sure. Uh, Colin, you said there were comic books after the fact. Is this solely based on a script that this guy wrote? Yes, this is. Uh, well, it's, it's property. It's a bunch of ideas from a bunch of scripts that he had generated yeah, over the years, and so that. he had created these characters. I guess you know, in a bunch of different things, and then just shoehorned it all into one. <laughs> that makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. but Tim. Yeah, Perfect Tim is one of the Hong Kong Cavaliers. Uh, Jeff Goldblum plays New Jersey. He's dressed as a cowboy. 
they call them New Jersey. Why? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, they are in New Jersey, aren't they? Isn't this where the it does take place on the East Coast. You're correct. Um, yes. Is Clancy Brown like Tex or Rawhide? Rawhide. 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 You know, well, he is Tex, but yeah, Rawhide. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Alice, he was from Detroit. <laughs> Well, some of these guys, are they all scientists? I think there are gun-wielding scientists who assist Buckaroo Banzai, who has this... Band on the weekend. Yeah, right? Ew. They play dive bars on the weekend. Because like, was, the was, when they were doing, when he was doing, like, the test drive, some of his bandmates were just, like, sitting there chilling like they were just waiting for him. So I'm like, I don't know if they're all scientists, or just some of them are. I think some of them were just there for the ride. So some of them are scientists, some of them are doctors. Jeff Goldblum is a doctor that he meets in uh, brain surgery uh, and invites him to kind of join the Hong Kong Cavaliers. So maybe these are just all the guys that Buckaroo knows in the various disciplines that he has mastered in the world. Buckaroo Banzai, er, sorry, is played by, uh, we didn't mention, but Peter Weller is Buckaroo Banzai. Um, I think, like, he's well on his way on the, the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame, right? Because we did Of Unknown Origin, and we did, I think, did we do two RoboCops? Yeah, he's, he's in. He's on the wall. This one, he's at least, this is his fourth. Uh, yeah. Leviathan being the only one that would probably also show up on the show that's outstanding. Um, so he is a, uh, yeah, this multi-hyphenate uh, can do everything. Very famous, apparently, in this world. Um, but we're not sure if he's famous because he's a rock and roll star or because he's a you know sci- leading scientist. Uh, the government, he's got the president, like, you know, he can call the president up whenever he needs to um, because he's a kung fu master. There's video games. Kids are playing video games. They're not kids. There's guys playing video games. That's a Buckaroo Banzai video game. Somebody says that they recognize him from his comic books. The one kid has a hat with his like logo on it. Yeah, they have posters of all the guys. Like, and that kid, but that in kid is in the new dimension. Which this is the huge problem I have with this movie is so he goes through the mountain, comes into the other dimension, and the people in the other dimension not only know who he is, but know that he flew through into their dimension. No, 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 no. And he's like famous in both dimensions. How no, is- he comes back into our dimension. The eighth dimension was he went through the mountain. That was the eighth dimension was being able okay. to cross through that space. So once he comes back, he's back in the the regular world. But he can now see people from the eighth dimension. But that's not well. That only happens. But wherever he goes, people know who he is and know that he traveled through different dimensions. How? Yeah. Well, I think it's like the uh, uh, back in the uh, like the era of the right stuff, like them doing test launches and shit. Like you just he's like an astronaut. You just become famous because you know you're just doing the shit. I'm right. sure it was so broadcast. Like, so right, like I experiment, and he was just like, oh, it wasn't the news. This is the dude that. I think, to another dimension. I, think I guess he makes though, in the this, news no matter what. But I, I feel like when this movie started, I didn't know if traveling through dimensions was like a back to the future thing where it's like an underground thing that only the people participating in know about, or is this like a space launch? That's not clear. No, it's not yeah, clear at all. You're right. Yeah, the only way that I'm getting it is because he was interviewed by a reporter, I think, and that was we didn't actually see the scene. It was that was the scene that was on TV that John Lithgow was watching. Because John Lithgow, as Emilio Lazardo, aka John Orphan, the one of the Johns, this is where we're going to go. There's a bunch of alien Johns, uh, has been living in a uh, insane asylum. And he sees that Buckaroo Banzai is cracked into the eighth dimension with his over thruster. He's like, I got to get that over thruster because that's the thing that's going to take me home. And so he escapes from the mental institution. Yeah. Um, Buckaroo. Uh, so he has these guys with him. Uh, they're also his band. They go to play uh, one night in uh, some dive bar in New Jersey, which, of course, it's the 80s, so you got uh, you know neon lights all over the place. Oh, of course. Neon lights, jackets with the sleeves rolled up. Yeah, 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 because that's the look, right? Like, I mean, because he wears, like, a bow tie and, like, a suit, you know? Yeah. This is the, the my, I keep saying it's Miami Vice. Miami Vice, for some reason, to me, like, defined the fashion sense of the 1980s. I mean, um, it kind of did, because anytime anybody goes to an 80s party, I mean, what are the guys dressed up as? They put the jackets on, they roll their sleeves up there. It's Miami Vice all the time. Mm-hmm. You kind of roll up those sleeves. That's where they're right. Yeah, so McKay, in our group chat, Michaela pointed out that they look like Huey Lewis in the news, and I have yeah, to agree with that. True. 
Yeah, especially his hair and like the way like the collar jacket kind of combination. He had a real Huey Lewis thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at this bar, they meet uh, another character. This is uh, Penny. What was Penny's last name? Pretty. Penny Pretty. <laughs> it's Peggy, Colin. Peggy? Peggy Pretty. I'm kidding. I'm, it? I'm kidding. No, it's no. Penny. It's the, Penny. Joke, the joke is that he keeps calling her Peggy. Yeah. Because this scene, it, man. Ooh, tell me about it. Well, I mean, uh, so we, we, <laughs> this is where we see, uh, this first time we see Buckaroo uh, Buck really jam out with his band for the first time. Like, um, you know, we've heard we've heard of his talents, but now we get to see him fully rocking and rolling with his band. <laughs> and then he stops in the middle of his set. He's like very quietly in the mic. So another crime. Going out in the dark. There's another crime. <laughs> you do that. And he points around the crowd because she's sitting there the only one crying. And then there's just this weird, really weird back and forth where he's yelling at her and She's talking to him, and then he plays a song for her on the piano, and then she's going to blow her brains out. Like, we go some places pretty quick in this scene. <laughs> and it's we really weird. Places. We go some places, and we go nowhere. All and we go nowhere. Time. Like, yeah. yeah. And well, so, I mean, it's just a, it's an odd scene to meet what is our other character, Penny, played by Alan Barkin, um, I should say. Um, yeah, because and- remember, Sean, no matter where you go, there you are. Is this where that comes from? Well, I've heard see, that so many times in my life. Uh, so a lot of people, I because I looked at when you look up Buckaroo Bonsai, it turns out a lot of people give Buckaroo Bonsai credit as coming up with that saying. Uh, but it turns out that's not entirely true. It actually came from the uh, University of Pennsylvania in 1955. I think it was the first time that somebody actually said it. So there you go. I just ruined everybody. Who, like you know, Buckaroo Bonsai is where that phrase comes from. <laughs> It's uh, nice to have some clarity on it, finally. <laughs> Do you know who said it at the university? It was in a pamphlet, uh, apparently, that circulated, and it was either done satirically or something like that. Uh, yeah, 1955. That's the first recorded, you know, wherever you go, there you are. Uh, profound. Um, yeah, because she's going to shoot herself, right? She's got a gun. She's going to shoot herself, like, right there. She's all depressed. He's singing uh, Since I Don't Have You, right? Classic song. His backup band, it turns out, is uh, Billy Vera and the Beaters, who had, a, maybe they were a one-hit wonder. You remember that song, uh, At This Moment? What did you think? That one? No? That's as far a as few more bars? Please. No, no. It does That's sound it. familiar. <laughs> a couple it more. Some more, Colin. It's, so, it's on the tip of my tongue, Colin. <laughs> Please. So, anyway, he, uh, well, does he save her from this? Uh... Accidentally. She Accidentally. Be dead. So somehow, this is when all the guys like in the band draw guns, and you're like, okay, well, you know, well, these guys are right. all cowboys. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she yeah. reminds him of his dead wife. This is like another thing. You're like, okay, so he was married to his first love, his wife, who looked just like Penny, but it turns out she, you know, he's like, well, we're, we're, who's your parents? And like, She's adopted. He's like, I knew it. <laughs> I married your sister. <laughs> no, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> Weird. Um, you make it, although you say it, you make it sound simpler than it fucking came across in this movie. Yeah. Because you just said the lines directly one after the other, which they don't do. It's like no. one little line spread out throughout the entire movie. Little bits of story are in there. Right. Ugh. Well, our story is interrupted by the arrival of the Lectroids. Um, and the, so there's a, there's a, there's a spaceship that's hovering over the earth. This thing looks like, um, starfish, giant starfish. It looks like if you've seen, um, like an up close photo of a bed bug in a textbook. Yes, or something like that. Or, uh, like you know under a microscope. Like? That's what it looks like. You know, you know, the sculpture from Beetlejuice. That that's what it is. <laughs> that's what it looks like. <laughs> that's what it is. So it's just like that, basically. Yeah. It's kind of like a sea, a, a little bit of seashell, one of them. A little bit. But yeah. Yeah. The Electroids, it turns out. A sea monkey? What's like a sea monkey? Are the ones that, um, because I think at a press conference, right, where Buckaroo is trying to explain, like, how his uh, overthruster works in basically dispersing neutrons and atoms or whatever so you can move through it, um, he gets a call from the President of the United States. 
But it turns out the electroids hovering in the alien ship interfere with that call, and they give him, through that, some kind of electricity that, when it zaps him, allows him to see electroids in there who are disguised as human beings on planet Earth uh, as they actually look, which is kind of like uh, fish people. No, but how would we describe them? Big Black bulbous eyes. eyes. Yeah. They kind of look like a little bit like any mine. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. 1985. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're in that era, right? Yeah, this is just what they were just brown shit aliens at this point. Yeah. I don't know, you sit there and you're like Enemy Mine and The Last Starfighter. I think that was eighty four. I mean like yeah. this is yeah. the era of like these kind of sci fi movies. They look a little Star Wars y. Like in oh, the man. Cantina kind of. Yeah. They walked off the back lot from Star Wars, so they, yeah. they're like, We're gonna put you yeah. in this one. I feel like they look like TNG like kind of aliens more than... I don't think they're quite Star Wars quality. Yeah, they're, well, I mean, no. but they're like original, like, original werewolf Star Wars quality. That's, that's a kind of... <laughs> yeah. Um, any, if I say the name Star Lord, you guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? Oh, it sounds very familiar. Shit. Starlog was a magazine where I think it was a magazine. First, yeah, yeah, this is where I first heard of uh, Buckaroo Banzai. But this was like a devoted to science fiction magazine. Uh, Starlog Press actually created Fangoria. Fangoria was like the little brother of Starlog. It was the big one. Okay. And now it's like nobody fucking remembers Starlog, but right. Fangoria is still around. God damn it. Um, but anyway, uh, so now gifted with this ability to see electroids, um, he sees Dan Hedaya and Christopher Lloyd are in this movie there, and Vincent Schiavelli, right? Yeah. I'm just gonna keep throwing names out there because like this movie is full of like holy shit, it's yeah. them. <laughs> it's that guy. Yeah. Um they're all electroids trying to find the overthruster circuit. I will say this this whole plot point of him being able to see what they actually look like was very confusing to the viewer. I don't know that this was very well expressed at any point. I was very confused by this. The Just th- that they would show up and look like aliens in one scene. I don't and- think they explained it well enough, so I really didn't understand what was happening. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't yeah. either. I was... I. My husband explained it to me because he had seen it before, and I was like, well, okay, I shouldn't have to have someone who's seen it before explain it to me to understand what's happening. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I guess I got that that's what was happening. Like, he was able to see them as, like, as they actually are or whatever. This is followed by, like, a scene where um, an alien ship crash lands. This is where I was trying to figure out, like, okay, is John Lithgow and his alien race, are they the bad guys? It's like, no. There's actually good luck droids. They're the ones who are up in the ship because they all look the same. They're all like the fish people. We yeah. can't tell. But when these guys come down to Earth and assume human form, they look like Rastafarians, right? And they are desperately trying to get a message to Buckaroo Banzai. This is because now having been alerted to the fact that uh, Lazaro, sorry, John Warfin, right? They're all named John. Is that like a joke that this movie's a comedy, right? There's a bunch of jokes that like I didn't find uh, funny, but I'm like, this level, movie's supposed to be a comedy. It's no, I figured out what it was. It is they're telling the punchline to a joke only they know. That's why we don't find it funny. They know all this stuff, but yeah. we don't. I think there was one line in this movie that made me chuckle. Just one. The the one thing that made me laugh was the sign what? on the door that said secret and or spelled weirdly it was like do don't come in here but, but it was the one, spelled like alien was spell shit. The one thing that got me was when John Lithgow was like leading them in a in a like the last hurrah and he was like when are we gonna go? And they're like pretty soon <laughs> That was the only one that get, got me. I chuckled at that one. <laughs> Yeah. They, Otherwise, uh, no, I have no idea if this is supposed to be a comedy because it didn't work. That's the only way that I can read it. The, the, the tone of it is kind of, I don't know if punk is the right word. I mean, punk music to me was always like, you know, these are just people fucking off who somehow ended up getting like a label release and are able, and they're pulling a giant con on the, uh, 
the people who, you know, the studio that put them out. And I, it almost feels like this movie has that kind of rebellious attitude where it's like, we're pulling one over on the people who gave us the money and just right. making you believe this. They let us make this. Yeah. 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 There's actually, but are you really pulling one over if your movie doesn't even break even? Well, if it's not successful, then I mean, that's, I mean, a thing. Yeah, that's the, that's the ultimate indicator that it was, I mean, they pulled it over on them in order to make it, but uh, I guess it didn't go far enough to an audience. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, yeah. Congratulations. You got your movie made. It was still a failure. Like, yeah, but it has survived uh, long enough that now people are recommending that we watch it. I mean, it has a cult following. I think, like, when you, I mean, it does have, like, a significant cult following, it seems like, you know, when I was doing some research for it. And I've oh, yeah. always heard the name, The Adventures of Buckaroo Bonsai. And it's yeah, been we, we have all heard stuff. of this movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my uh, college had a Buckaroo Bonsai cardboard standout in the classroom forever among the film schools. Uh, yeah, people know this and like this movie. Yeah, I know a couple of people active. So I mean, that might be considered a, a even a better measure of success than a, you know the uh, the box the studio would say the box office. <laughs> you know, right. the filmmakers but, might go like, "Well, we're still talking about it like thirty odd years later." And um, the filmmakers may not have cared even when they made it. They're just like, "We have to make it." That's that's how they want. It. They don't care if it's a, a bomb at the box office or anything. They like you said, it's punk. They got to make it, and they don't care who who likes it or not, or who even gets it. Which feels like the attitude that was going into making this. It's like we don't care. Like we're making this because we think this is something. Yeah, there is like a super in joke in the movie uh, that I was able to turn up. Uh, you remember the scene with the watermelon? Uh, at some point, they the very tense scene. They're trying to find like somebody who's going through a vent or something. They walk into a room, and I think Jeff Goldblum's like, "What's that watermelon doing here?" I said, I'll tell you later, and they exit the room. That was because they were convinced that the studio bosses weren't paying any attention to what they were shooting. And so they shot that scene, and nobody said anything about it. They're like, nobody's even fucking paying any attention to what we do here. We can do whatever we want. And it's in the movie. <laughs> I, I must have missed that scene. <laughs> yeah, watermelon. A watermelon. Um, okay, so, uh, so the... The Rastafarian uh, electroids are trying to find... Say that, say that sentence yeah. again, Colin. Say yeah. that sentence again. <laughs> we need to reiterate what you just said. Rastafarian? <laughs> the Rastafarian electroids. Yeah. That was a thing in this movie. Okay, yeah, electroids. <laughs> um, we're governed by a bunch of guys who are playing chess somewhere on like an alien planet or something. I don't know what the fuck. There's a lot of visuals in this that are like, huh, what, what are we looking at? We just made something up on the day. We're being yeah. creative, damn it, because that's what we are. We're creative Hollywood people, and we're turned loose. So we can do whatever we want. Um, so the sh because they're aware that um, John uh, Orphan, right, this evil yeah. guy from their planet who had been exiled to the eighth dimension and now freed because of these human experiments is around again. They're basically warning the Earth that you have until sundown today. Otherwise, we're going to blow you up. For some reason, they're going to blow up Russia, which the United States or Russia is going to mistake as a nuclear strike for the United States and World War Three. And this is all going to be a horrible thing. Why? Yeah, I don't know, because to, uh, he's in, like, he's uh, in America. Woman. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't get that plot point. Why they were why they were targeting Russia with their death ray from space. Um. Uh -uh. Because it's uh, 1984, it's, you know... Yeah, Cold War still happening. There you go. We're at the false thing. Yeah. Um, so, thus begins... Um, I don't even know. I mean, there's chase yeah. scenes. We, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we get a little lost in there, don't you, Colin? Exactly. <laughs> we should just... Colin, we're just going to let you swim and see if yeah. you can get us through this thing. Because I, I would love to just jump in here and help you, but I can't. I yeah, just, you're on your own, yeah. Colin. Yeah, it didn't we'll stick for me. Like, there's so much, again, there's so much of them having a good time because of their, because, you know, their jokes and they want to know what's going on. Like, I can't access this movie. I have okay. no clue what's going on right now. Okay, at some point, someone steals the interaster or whatever it's called. That's right. They go to yeah. the lab, the Buckaroo Bonsai lab, to do it. And in doing so, 
the uh, guys, the the electroids, like shoot little like spider looking things from their mouth. I oh, think right, yeah. that paralyze you and pump you full of venom. And uh, I think Clancy Brown takes one for Buckaroo Banzai, and he ends up uh, dying. It's very sad. And yeah, he died. Yeah, it was a very dramatic like died in his arms moment, or it was supposed to be, but it, <laughs> right. it was what it was. <laughs> There was a little side hug, and then they moved on. Yeah. Yeah, because there's too many guys on this team that I can't remember. I mean, I, it was like, I got Jeff Goldblum, New Jersey, Clancy Brown, Rawhide. There's some perfect, guy named Perfect uh, Tim. Perfect, yeah, Perfect Tim or Perfect Tom. Uh, yeah, there's Dr. Ito, who I believe um, was part of the 1930, was he part of the 30s, 8 experiment? Yes, he was. He was the younger version uh, with John Lithgow when John Lithgow shoved himself into the wall and got possessed by uh, the aliens. Did anyone else notice? And they should have, they didn't continue this. Um, John Lithgow and Christopher Lloyd are gingers in this movie because because they have been alienized. Yeah. I wonder why they did continue that with all the other aliens. Why weren't they all gingers? Hmm. Only that if you've been, been possessed, else. right? Or something? Well, is it that natural aliens are regular, but if you've been possessed, you turn ginger? Well, the regular aliens are Rastafarians, right? They're all Rastafarians. Are they all? I, I, I think so. We don't see, we only see two of them and I they look identical. I don't oh, think okay. they all are. Yeah. John O'Connor. I feel like at one point, I feel like at one point they make a comment about that. Yeah. It's very strange. Okay, so that's one that we, we don't know. Well, there we go. But yeah, the, the gingers are the evil ones. I just want to point that out. <laughs> that's right. As they're running around trying to reclaim this thing, they uh, end up uh, kidnapping uh, Ellen Barkin. What's her mm-hmm. most famous movie? What do you know Ellen Barkin from? Drop Dead Gorgeous. The Fan. Oh, Wesley okay. Snipes one? No. The, like, 80s one. Who else was in that? Wasn't that Lauren Bacall and Michael um, Bean? Oh, no, she was Sea of Love with Al Pacino. Yeah. yeah, that's probably the one I would go to. Or the Big Easy, Dennis Quaid. Oh, yeah, no, it, it was the Wesley Snipes, the fan. Yeah, with De Niro. Okay, yep, <laughs> yeah, that, yep, yep. And John Leguizamo. Yeah, yep. that's like what I, the, probably the first thing I remember seeing her in. But yeah, also Drop Dead Gorgeous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She, she was in one of the, one of the Ocean's movies, too, wasn't she? She was, yeah. I feel like she pops up everywhere. Yeah. No, she's not given much to do here. She's kidnapped and then strapped to a table uh, because basically she has uh, the circuit that they're looking for, right? Ito gives it to her, and then she's captured by the bad guys, and then they lure Buckaroo and his surviving team to um, whatever this warehouse is where they're preparing the launch of their ship. Which I'm not sure where that came from, but whatever. There's a bunch of them milling around, and um, oh, we didn't talk about the Baker Street Irregulars either. They're not the Baker Street Irregulars. They're called like the uh, that'd be Sherlock Holmes. It's the the version of that. It's like the Blue Streak Irregulars or whatever, which Scooter and his dad are a part of. Scoot- These are two characters who come in from nowhere. Remember, they recruited. No, like, I needs you. I have no idea what you're talking. <laughs> no, I remember. I remember the kid and his dad, but I assumed he was oh, just a fan. Right, 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 right. When they do the massive call out, we need help. But Bucker Robanza needs help. And these two come on. Okay, now I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the bad guys steal the his helicopter, right? right. <laughs> That's how they're able to get away. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we get to the uh, big warehouse. And then John uh, Lithgow, like, reappears. Where has he been for, like, the rest of the movie? I don't even know. Because Christopher Lloyd's character, uh, what's his funny last name? Bootay. Big Bootay. Big Booty. Big Booty. Big Booty. Yeah. (laughs) See, that's that juvenile sense of humor I'm talking about. This is is a fucking kid's movie, guys. That's a kid's movie joke. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You're not wrong. Appealing to the 12-year-old. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there's some kind of strife, right, between, uh, Big Boutte, or John Boutte, sorry, and John Warren, <laughs> uh, right, as they're trying to pilot the ship, and they've got the spectrometer, the overthruster, or whatever, and they end up getting Buckaroo, like, into this, uh, contraption, and they're going to blast through 
uh, like a wall into the eighth dimension, and they're gonna go home. Uh, <laughs> why, and why are we? Why don't we want them to go home? Do we want them to go home? Because he's I'm he's he's gonna end up enslaving his own people or something. They just said that he was basically like your Hitler, and that's why him and uh, his cronies were rounded up and banished to the Phantoms. I'm sorry. The uh, eighth dimension. <laughs> like we want to say Phantom Zone, we want to say Overdriver. And it's like it's... Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what bearing uh, him being a, a popular rock star, being a martial artist, or being a neurosurgeon or a physicist, quantum physicist has to do with any of this, other than we're just going to say it, right? Yeah. It's not like any of these talents are really. It's because calm. it's cool because this movie was written by a five year old. Like yeah. it's because it's cool. That's it. It's, I mean, it's got to be. There's, there's well, what was in the air at that time for doing these things is like it feels like this was specifically of the eighties. I don't know. I don't know. My finger hard, but. Just having and being able to be all those things. Yeah. yeah, apparently that makes us think that he has more credibility. I don't know. I, I think it's just to show that he's so good at, as he's just so good that he's mastered so many different things. Yeah, you know who else did this? He's Renaria, the fucking leader of the Nexium cult. He was all like, I have degrees in math and physics. I'm a pianist. I'm a judo champion. All this bullshit to try to get people to like him. It's juvenile. But it seems like, I mean, you know, if you're going to put all that stuff in a movie, then there's got to be the scene where, I mean, not just the scene where you're doing the brain surgery at the beginning to set up the year brain surgery. Right? That's why he's late to the fucking test pilot, Helio, because he's too busy doing brain surgery. There has to be a scene where, like, his skill as a neurosurgeon really comes into play, right? Yes, he's not his off in this fucking movie. Yeah. This or his is, skill as a martial arts yeah. expert. We never see him doing martial arts. Why is he not? I never. Ask. Like, why are we not seeing this? What was the point? Yeah, if that wasn't in the crawl, we wouldn't have known about that at all. Um, I mean, we see him, you know, dressed in samurai robes because they travel on this tour bus uh, called, you know, it has Buckaroo Banzai and the Hong Kong Cavaliers on the side of it. And we see part of it. It's like the living quarters. Or Buckaroo does his, you know, like samurai sword, dressed as a samurai, you know, uh, meditation while everybody else hangs out. Then it turns out that that also has like a, not a science lab, but it's got like the command center. There's a couple guys running the, you know, the board with all the flashing lights and the TV screens on it. <clears throat> right. And then the joke is they do twice. It's just like, uh, what was the first part of the joke? It's like, uh, do you want us to do this? And should we attack Russia? Uh, yes, I'm the first one, no one the second. So, wait, are we attacking Russia? <laughs> <laughs> when they started doing it, not only is this, I don't know where I'm at in this movie, but when they start redoing jokes verbatim, and I'm pretty sure they just cut the scene and put it in there again, it really starts to fuck with you. And I couldn't call this before, and now I think I'm back at the beginning of the movie. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah, it is really, it's, it's strange. It's part of that world building. Part of that wor world building it also involves, like, strange and crazy technology. That scene, like some of the stuff, you're just like they're just doing this to be weird. The scene where they do receive the um, message, the holographic message from the electroids, right? Everybody has to put on these these like masks, the wrap masks, right? Like yeah. it's like, yeah, it's looks like what a bubble. The purpose, right? It's just like it just looks cool. Does it? It's just or weird. It just looks. It's it's. Weird. I mean, think of like what art was in the eighties. Like, um, uh, I'm showing you that. It was Andy Warhol a thing. No, it was like sixties. Sixties. Geez, I'm way off. But like, just look at what you know the art scene was. Like, it, it starts to make more sense. In the movie. Yeah, it's like it's a bunch of uh, cones and and uh, rods, rods and cones all hooked together, and then we ended up with lamps. So we're like eighties Art Deco project. Yeah. Um, the uh, I'm taking here somewhere. yeah. Well, the <laughs> ending is basically uh, Bakaru ends up taking off on this ship. The uh, the electroids aren't able to piloted by John Lithgow. He's not able to actually uh, converge the rays that will open the uh, you know the eighth dimension because somehow I think Scooter 
of the Baker Street Regulars has the circuit that's actually needed. Somehow how he got it, I'm not sure, because Ellen Parker was supposed to have it. Um, but anyway, so their gizmo doesn't work, so there's like an aerial chase where they eject Buckaroo in like a smaller pod thing, and he's able to somehow use the guns and blow that ship up, and I'll get you, Buckaroo Bonsai, if it's the last thing I do, you know. John Lukow shouts before he's blown out of the sky. Thank God he saved the world. The president's very happy. The president makes a couple appearances. He's in a back brace for no other apparent reason other than, like, this will be weird if the president is, you know, undergoing back surgery and in this, like, movable table. So whenever he gets the message, we also have to strap the bubble wrap yeah. glasses on him. Yeah. It would have made more sense if Bucker Banzai was his surgeon and he had to do his surgery. See, there you go. It's all about setups and payoffs. These are kind of like the things that kind of make movies. Setups, payoffs, character arcs. <laughs> right? Uh, I don't know where, like, Buckaroo Banzai's character arc. Um, there isn't one. I don't think he gets one. He doesn't have an arc. But I don't he's think the he's same throughout the entire movie. He has no... Colin, he's already the perfect kiss a- kick-ass man. He can do right. everything. What arc does he need to have? He's, yeah. he's got a gaping hole in his heart. Michaela, because he lost his wife and somehow he's able to fill it by finding her twin sister who didn't know she had a You know, I don't sister. know if it was uh, a writer thing, a direction, or an actor's choice, but I really didn't get that much feeling from him talking about his ex-wife. I he was just kind of like, and, you know, she's gone. Yeah. But part of that's yeah, Peter Weller. Was- like, not the, the, like, you know, the guy in the font of uh, deep welling emotion. <laughs> They cast him yeah, as Robocop so, for a reason. But, I'm concerned. Like, that guy is kind of mechanical and robotic. Yes, sir. Um, is he your hero, Colin? Huh? Is he your hero? I see what you is did there. Is he your robot? Uh, <laughs> um, the very end of this movie, uh, once, you know, happy endings all around for all the people who survived anyway, were killed by electroids. Um, there's a music video. Oh, yeah. Holly, we just lost Holly. Holly's like she's done. She's Holly calling just, the no. <laughs> Holly, Holly, put the rope down. Holly. Well, what? Why does that provoke such a uh, response? I I kind of did like this music video. Oh, God, this might be my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> I I don't know why. It just that that little music. Because there's the only thing that like you could follow. It was just people walking. Yeah. Right. You're just Short. walking through Thunder Road from Greece. Like that was it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was like, hey, I know that location. Something yeah. to grab onto. <laughs> yeah, that was in the uh, last section. How is he dressed like Huey Herman? Yeah, it's in like the Sepulveda Basin or something. You've seen it in a ton of movies in California. Yeah. They're all just walking around, led by Scooter, and they end They're up walking doing, at like, a very specific pace, and I'm sorry, you two, but Michaela, it was the, it was the same as um, in Gilmore Girls' Year in the Life. With the Life and Death Brigade, like when they're walking down the street. Yeah, that it's horrible scene. scene. That horrible Two terrible scene. scenes that did the same thing, yeah. Yes. Same thing. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I think it would have been cooler if there was a uh, actual, uh, like they were singing or voicing you know, a song or something that's just an instrumental thing. They also, Apparently the very end, were. the very end of the movie, right, was that um, uh, Ellen Barkin's character is dead. Uh, um, surgeon. Uh, Jeff Goldblum has done everything that he can for her, but the alien energy that Bakaru Banzai still has residual left in his body, he's able to kiss her, basically, and, and wake her up. And then we fade to these alien chess players, right, sitting on these impossibly tall tables, and what I think, like, a face fades in, he says something like, <clears throat> Big Yeah, what did he say? Did anyone catch it? It was like big deal or something like that, right? And then yeah. and that was it. And we're like, we're- I'm going to be honest. I had quit on this movie long before this, so I didn't really care. <laughs> I don't think anyone well, in the making this movie cared either. So you're fine. <laughs> making punk, of a, yeah, punk, punk movie classic, cult classic. Um, I mean, that's the thing that I'm sure. grappling with is just the ability of this film to uh, endure. But Hang maybe on it's, for dear fucking life. Yeah, because it's never regarded like in a way like Troll 2 is, you know, or like Troll 2, I get it. It's like this is a horribly bad movie that's hilarious because it's inept. 
And so people kind of hang on to it. Like, you gotta see this. This is the worst movie ever made. But yeah, Buckaroo Banzai doesn't. We like this. Yeah, but it it doesn't feel like that, right? No, That's not, not what we're talking all. about here. I don't really like this movie. Like, not as in like, oh, it's bad. That's why I love it. People love this movie. Yeah. So then, like, is it a taste thing? I mean, we just watched it. Uh, Again, uh, I, think it. That, I think that Kayla hit it right on the head. I think it's like, this is a movie you saw when you were a kid. Probably loved yeah. it because who didn't want to be like, oh, he's a rock star and he's like, he's in space and he's fighting aliens. Like, this is the coolest movie in the world for a kid. But the production design of it now, you know, does kind of feel like, man, this is an old movie. You know, I mean, that, that really came across because it feels like, you know, I, mean, I guess I can kind of, you know, imagine in the age of Marvel like CG what this might look like now versus what it looks like then. Which I think the cinematographer of Blade Runner like shot half of it before he was fired. So it's like that kind of, not the production design, but the cinematography. Is that kind of like, you know, what would you say? There's a lot of concrete, a lot of shadow and light, and not very pretty looking pictures. Um, it has a kind of drab look. All the, the special effects work all kind of seems like, yeah, leftover Star Wars stuff, but not, you know, the, the stuff that wasn't executed well in Star Wars, like ended up in a... Uh, a locker somewhere, and these guys got their hands on it. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I mean, maybe we should save this stuff for our review. <laughs> As we go around the table. No, I'm leaving it, I'm leaving it all on the floor, Kyle, on this set. <laughs> no review, I'm out. All right, well, let's find out if we, how we came down on the Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, if anybody here would recommend it to you. But first, you have to summon our mailman. His name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters! Masters, the mail! I've got the mail! So many letters, our followers are rising. Rising. Why, thank you, Igor. I'm surprised you could hear that summons, but uh, I'm glad you're here. That was pretty good, Igor. I barely clapped. You know, Sean put as much effort into that clap as they put into this movie, so (laughs) that's fair. All right, well, we want to let you know how you can participate in this interactive section of the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. Uh, All you got to do is follow along on social media. You can find us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or Twitter. At Saturday Night Freak Show. Or you can email us directly. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or follow along on Instagram for the time of your life at Saturday Night Freak Show. First of all, pardon me. Uh, MF Mad it was the uh, designated keeper of the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. Uh, does due diligence every week, and we greatly appreciate this. Um, so we have inducted uh, now five people off of this movie onto five. Five. Okay, here we go. Uh, no, surprisingly enough, um, he was we, already he's on the already on. He's already on the wall. Yeah, we did everything. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. John Lithgow is making his appearance on Saturday Night Freak Show Hall of Fame because he was in Buckaroo Banzai, he was in Cliffhanger, and he was in Pet Cemetery, all of which we did on the show. Uh, Clancy Brown making his debut because he was in Buckaroo Banzai, Pet Cemetery 2, and the abysmal remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Vincent Chiavelli. Was recently in Ghost. He was also in the Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, and he was a uh, voice in the animated movie American Pop. Uh, Matt Clark. You're like, who the fuck was he? He was the Secretary of Defense in Buckaroo Banzai, but he was also Uncle Henry in The Return to Oz, and he was Chester the Bartender in Back to the Future Part 3. His face you would recommend or recognize. Yep. Uh, Bill yeah. Henderson was also. On the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame, he was uh, Casper Lindley in Buckaroo Banzai. That would be Scooter's dad. He was the cop in Clue, and he was also Charlie in No Holds Bar. So welcome, <laughs> one and all. Welcome. That is that is quite the the filmography you got there, sir. I, I, I was like gonna say. 
Yeah, these I was, yeah, there's a, these are some great actors, but some of their absolute worst stuff. Holy yeah. shit. <laughs> John Lithgow and Clancy Brown specifically. I'm right. sorry. Oof. That's, not, that's not a good way to get on the wall. Yeah. Well, that means you've been in some shit. Both of them. Pet Cemetery movies, strangely enough. Uh, okay, so about uh, Buckaroo Banzai, we got some mail. Hogan, 70, Hogan X 74 says, no matter where you go. There you are. Yep. Uh, Robin Lineman Silverberg says this should be a fun review. I'm not sure if you'll like it, but it should make for an interesting conversation. Uh, Peter Gatt said to me, this felt like the third film in a five part series. You're struggling to understand <laughs> each character, in my opinion. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael Whitaker says it's a fun movie. I always thought that if America was going to do Doctor Who, it would be something like this. This was very close to being turned into a television series by Kevin Smith. Apparently, the studio didn't want to work with the original writers. Kevin Smith had brought along or something like that, so he backed out, and the whole project fell apart. Um, I'm okay with that. Nelson Nascimento says, I watched this constantly on cable in the 80s, a true one-of-a-kind and acquired taste for sure. I love it and always wish there had been a follow-up. I'm looking forward to hearing the Freak Show break this down. Um, I think we did mention, right, at the end of the movie, it teases... Uh, stay tuned for the next adventure of Buckaroo Banzai versus the World Crime League. Like comes up on yeah. Yeah. okay. Uh, Novato Judoka says between this and unknown of unknown origin, my film knowledge on Peter Weller has increased dramatically from other than just RoboCop and interviews about RoboCop. There you go. You all right? Happy to help. Using <laughs> RoboCop too, for God's sakes. Okay. Well, I'm interviews for RoboCop too. Yeah, glad we're helping out there. Uh, about uh, last week, we watched the movie called The Hidden. Uh, Matthew Ola wrote in and said, it's like, I come in peace and a baby with fallen. Yep. <laughs> uh, Andrew Ballstorff says, I voted for that one. It's a classic 80s action sci-fi movie. I'd have to agree with you. We all love it. All right, we'll, we'll hear more about The Hidden probably on our next week episode. Um, the prior week, watched uh, Big Trouble in Little China. Simon Carter writes in and says, the fact that this movie tanked is a fucking travesty. I want to find the movie-going audience of 1986 and slap the shit out of them. I was only six at the time, so I couldn't help the box office if I wanted to. Plus, I lived in a tiny backwoods village in the UK that took forever to get the movies in the local cinema. In 86, I imagine they were still showing the first run at Jaws, for fuck's sake. Anyway, this movie and the thing have become the movies I turn to when things are shitty. You can sit down with some booze and relax. But either one, no matter how many times I've seen them, what the fuck happened to John Carpenter? Yeah. Yeah. I love the passion behind that. Yeah. I love it. That's great. Well, Roy Guy writes in. He says, uh, John Carpenter is my favorite director of all time. It's a criminally underrated film and one of my most owned films ever. A masterpiece in every sense of the word. It never gets old, nor ceases to amaze me. A film that took far too long to get the attention it deserves, as well as countless other Carpenter flicks. Much love to the Saturday Night Freak Show. Yeah, it's, it's a fun one. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about Kim Cattrall. Kim Cattrall was in Big Trouble in Little China. We were mentioning some of the movies that she was in. Grant Parrish says, Suddenly, Baby Geniuses isn't worthy of her resume. I see you, <laughs> Freak Showers. And Jesus sees you too. <laughs> I fucking had to watch that movie the other day. For work? For work. Please tell me it was for work and not just because you wanted to. No, it was for work. I mean, I punish myself when I watch movies, but this one was definitely for work. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Kim Cattrall, baby. <laughs> Jesus. Wow. And that's why you listen to the Saturday Night Freak Show. Yeah, we could do a whole episode on that one. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Teresa Ann, oh, we were talking about uh, James Hong. James Hong plays Lopan in the movie. Uh, she says, we forgot to mention that he was Tia Carrera's dad in Wayne's World 2. Did we not oh, bring that up? I thought oh, we did. I thought we did, too. I thought we mentioned it. Tragic. Perhaps we if did we that. didn't, shame on us. Jesus. Yes, I, heard, for I real. swear to God, somebody said Tia Carrera in that episode. I swear to God. We'll have to go back and listen to it. If we didn't, it. wow, shame well, on us. Well, Travis Legler I mean, I writes. I mentioned Paul from Curious so. Out. Right, that's right. That's there you go. <laughs> uh, Travis Legler writes in and says, "Sean, you're not alone. After the thing, Escape from L.A. is my second favorite Carpenter movie. 
I want John's score to that movie. There we go. That's your that's second bad. favorite? I know. You guys, I, there's something wrong. That's crazy high. That's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, Outranks you, Halloween is what you're saying. Yeah. Have you only seen two John Carpenter movies? Right. Yeah. yeah. Outranks uh, Escape from New York. I, think, from I think John Carpenter is varied enough where I think a lot of people are going to have different ones. Yeah, but... I think that is... John Carpenter might be the director who is the most, like, his movies are... A lot of people like different versions of his movies. So everyone, John Carpenter looks, I think, very different. All right. Uh, Raft Productions writes in and says, I've seen Big Trouble in Little China more times than I can count. I can't wait to listen to your take on this classic. Just remember, it's all in the reflexes. That's right. And the Chronicles of Not Riddick says, My dad showed this to me when I was little, and I found it weird because he barely watched movies or was into them, and he kind of reminds me of the protagonist. Then he asks... When will the freak show regulars reconvene in the dank, dark basement? I miss the days of hearing bottles being opened. <laughs> I mean, here, let me grab some right now. <laughs> yeah, just, well, I've been cracking them all the night. Uh, yeah. It's different, though. We can't hear that. Bottles. That's right. Well, I'm sure it's coming soon. All right. So now we're going to go around the room and we're going to the virtual room. The virtual basement. And go let you know. We're going to go around the Zoom. That's even there better. There you go. God damn it. Remind me about that next week. <laughs> Thank you. No, we're going to go Can around the one? Zoom. Can you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and let you know, we thought of tonight's movie, which was The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, starting with. Sean. Thank you. I will go first. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, like I said at the beginning of this, uh, this feels really like a whole, uh, a real big non sequitur of a movie. Like, I don't, wh- whoever said this is like the third movie of a five movie series, that's perfect. That's exactly what this feels like. This feels like we're missing so much more that these characters went through together that we should know in order for us to have some enjoyment in their interactions. Um, uh, I feel like we're missing a lot, I, but I, I, I mean, I do feel that the filmmakers are just like, yeah, we're going to fucking make it for the on screen, and we really don't care um, what people think of it. we got a studio to give us money to make this movie, and we're just going to make whatever the hell we want. And they did. Um, I get it if this is like... The only way I find this acceptable is if you watch this as a kid and fell in love with it, and it stayed with you as a doll. That mm-hmm. I can understand, because we've all got that. That happens to everybody. Um, I can't imagine there are new viewers to this movie who will carry on the tradition. I don't know. Uh, my kid fell asleep 10 minutes into it. Um, and that kid doesn't fall asleep for shit. So that should tell you something right there. Um, I do... Uh, uh, this movie was... Uh, I could not access this movie. Um, a lot of it didn't make sense or it's not like it's built to not make sense at a certain point. I don't know. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't get into this movie. Um, I'm glad I finally watched it because it's a movie I've heard about forever. So it's you know it was nice to finally see it, but uh, it's definitely not for me. Um, uh, you even said uh, the same writer as Big Trouble in Little China, right? Yeah. Which makes sense now that you now that you mentioned that on the podcast because um, Big Trouble was not like I said. Um, the other week. Not my favorite John Carpenter. This kind of feels like that, but obviously way worse. Like this, um, I think uh, that one had John Carpenter because uh, this one didn't as well. Um, I, I'm not going to recommend that you guys watch it. Because I don't think, I don't want to push it through it. Um, pass. I, I, done. Done. Goodbye. Uh, Holly, what did you think about? Uh, yeah, no, it sucked, Sean. That's that's what I think. Um, there was really no redeeming qualities about this movie. I mean, earlier I was saying, like, you know, John Lithgow can do no wrong, in my opinion, and it's true, but I don't care. I don't care about one this movie. Like, he was good. I liked all the weird shit he was doing. In this movie. Yeah, I, that I, my I, liked part. What, I liked what he was doing, but I still didn't care. Like, yeah. There was nothing redeeming. I was like, no, I just I don't want to sit through this just to watch him. Fuck that. No. 
So that was that was really I, I, I totally agree with you. If you watched this as a kid and this is a nostalgia thing, you grew up with it, I get it. We've all got it. But uh, I can't imagine anyone comes into this brand new and is like, yeah, I'm gonna revisit this one because it was boring. It's totally it's it's totally incomprehensive. It, it's yeah, there's nothing I can say good about this movie. It's boring, it's confusing. It doesn't have a structure. There's no arc. There's no, there's nothing. It's just weird and a mess. It's just a giant mess. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to pass. I'm done talking about this movie. No go. Not, not even Jeff Goldblum could make this movie really good. Yeah, like, yeah, Sean, I know you and I both love Jeff Goldblum like a lot. Yeah. You don't care. Not yeah. about, he's, he's not in it's cool, much, yeah. I just don't care. It's, no. So, Michaela, what did you think of this movie? Well, before I get into my review, I'm just going to say off the top, if you like this movie, if you grew up with it, you have a childhood attachment, like, you're probably not going to like us on this episode, and <laughs> that's fine. It's okay to like a movie. Yeah. It's okay to not like a movie. I honestly yeah. don't care for I don't feel, like, I don't hate this movie enough that I care if other people like it or not, you know? Yeah. Um, and I agree, Sean, I'm kind of glad I watched it just so I, like, got it off my list, you know? Yeah. Um, because I have heard so much about it over the years. Um, and maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe hearing about it all these years does build up some sort of expectation. Um, but you know, this movie feels like it was written by a coked out toddler, you know, it's like, and this happens and then this happens and he's a rock star and he's a neurosurgeon and he's a martial arts expert. It's like, that's not a movie. That's not a plot that is like childhood imagination just thrown at you. And maybe there's a place for that, but I don't know. What it, it's not in this movie because, like, I still don't know who this movie's for. I still mm-hmm. don't know what the point of this movie is. And, you know, when I hear the title, like, uh, uh, Across the Eighth Dimension or whatever, I guess I assumed it was going to be, like, this serialized, we're journeying through all these different dimensions. And I was like, that could be kind of cool. Like, that's kind of what, like, a Valerian-type movie does. Like, we're going to stop in this dimension to do this little short mission. Then we're going to stop here and do this one. That would be a movie, though, and that would be a plot, and that's not what this is. The only thing this movie commits to is being completely nonsensical. Like, that's its only goal, is to just just do whatever and just be full of nonsense. And you, you can't even say there's cool action set pieces or something nice to look at to make it worth it, because it doesn't even have any of that. Mm-hmm. And so, to me, like, there's nothing fun about it, there's nothing meaningful about it, it is just a pointless pointless movie i really don't understand the love for it unless it is a childhood thing i'm sorry we probably sound really mean on this episode (laughs) but i that's how i feel and you know you guys have been really good to us for listener request month i think coming right off the hidden which was another like 80s alien movie is not good for this movie like we just have that fresh in our memory and that movie was awesome so hard pass don't ever want to watch it again i wish this would get lost to the sands of time Colin, how do you feel? Damn, she put it in the sense of time. <laughs> she, sent this, she sent this movie to the cornfield. I think, uh, yeah, for some reason, once, uh, uh, who was it? You said um, that it felt like like if America did Doctor Who, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, Mike, Michael Whitaker. Um, I'm like, yeah, it does have that kind of like, because Doctor Who, I think, also has like a kind of a high buy in level yeah. but it appeals to uh science fiction aficionados right because of all the uh strange idea ideas that, that it kind of dangles out there right um and this movie does that like it's full to the brim of just new shit in every scene you know going like hey and then there's this there's this piece of technology and there's this weird thing you know um but i think <clears throat> You know, um, I think for a modern audience, and this is me, I guess, you know, having you know missed it, right? When I sit and look at it cold, you know, uh, there has to be some kind of relevance to you sitting here watching it now, right? Which I guess is the thing that breaks nostalgia, right? Nostalgia is like I loved it and it was relevant to me when I saw it. And every time I watch it, it takes me right back to that moment in time. And I'm like, okay, well, then I get it. I get if you like The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. I get if you like it 
because it has a punk sensibility, because it defies, you know, logic of, you know, screenplay construction, or, yeah. you know, uh, just throws watermelons in there. Yeah. It's full Syntax. of all these in jokes. Grammar, and probably. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I get it if you like it because you saw it then, or I get it if you like it now because, you know, you're like, well, I haven't seen anything like that before. Well, but I guess I'm sitting here from the perspective of that's just not enough for me. I didn't really care about what anybody was doing. My attention was focused on trying to follow the plot, uh, which I think I was able to do. I mean, I think, you know, we've been talking about it. I'm like, I think. Oh, yeah, we forgot to mention like a whole uh, tangent into the War of the Worlds broadcast that happened in 1938 oh, yeah. that was actually a cover for a real alien invasion. That's when the Electroids arrived. Um, Which is a great idea. But it's just kind of thrown out there. It really doesn't have yeah. anything to do other than, look, we mentioned this other science fiction. You know, we're being metatextual in a way and reconfiguring history so it works in the context of our movie. Good for you. Uh, but, you know, I think that's, again, what I'm talking about. It's like if it throws out this stuff that you're familiar with as a sci-fi aficionado, then it's connecting with you in a way that, you know, otherwise it's just you're throwing this kind of information out to the ether. And, you know, I think uh, me personally, I know I get it, but I'm, it's not that big of a deal to me when you make these references. So I was kind of sitting there cold. I didn't care about it i guess uh the humor i was able to recognize that it was there but i'm like this isn't actually funny to me i just didn't jibe with the tone of it i did think it looked ugly i think like uh i think michaela said there's no big action set pieces or like the scene that you're going to remember that they pulled off really well to me right i don't have that out of this it was an ugly looking movie with people who weren't interesting um yeah, I, I'm going to say, Pat, you don't need to see that. If you haven't seen it, uh, I don't think you're missing anything by skipping The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. I don't know why you'd even want to bring the character back, because there's really nothing there. He's a description. That's yeah. all he is, really. He's a, he's a collection of jobs. Uh, he's a resume. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, so, next, well, I guess it's a, we're saying that's a, a complete pass. Universal it's no. a universal no on <laughs> The Adventures yes. of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension. Gotta say the whole title. Um, next week, watching a movie chosen by you again. Last one. <laughs> last time. one. Better last make it, yeah. make it good. <laughs> Don't fuck it up. up. You have the you have the power to call an audible should you need to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Say it. Nobody has to know. But we won't know because Colin's the only one that knows the poll results, so he could right. probably know. This, this could be like four movies Colin wanted to watch. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, I know. Because you're just taking oh, my word no. on it. Yeah, it could be anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> Everyone's okay. like, I never voted for that. Right? <laughs> He's doing Colin suppressing Facebook messages. Uh, if the, last one, if the last one's Italian, we'll know, Colin. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell by the volume of, uh, of um, mail that we get on it. <laughs> so you're like, hey, I guess they did vote for it. Okay, well, this is the one that I'm like, I'm surprised that so many of you voted for it. Uh, but obviously, it's probably because we've talked about it and now made it one of those things that has been circling Saturday Night Freak Show for so long. You wanted oh, us to watch Killer Workout. Uh, so there you go. It finally <laughs> made it. Thank God, because it was going to be my we have to watch it now. We have to. Yeah, we got right. memes and all sorts of gifts and Yay. stuff like that. So there you go. Killer workout. Well, give us your words. Robicide. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Robicide. Uh, okay, so um, until then, I guess um, we're bidding you adieu as the basement itself here is going. <laughs>